My name is Alexandria French, and today I will be conducting a presentation on the role of civil military relations during the active genocide of the Rohingya population in Myanmar. First, I will discuss the significance of this crisis, followed by an overview of the cultural and historical background of Myanmar. Then I will begin analyzing the roles that the military, Swedo civilian government, and public play in the genocide, as well as outline the main explanatory factors and variables before concluding with the social implications for Myanmar, future of civil military scholarship, and policy recommendations. Today, there is a population of approximately 2.5 million stateless people known as the Rohingya. Over 2 million of these 2.5 million refugees have chosen to flee into the neighboring state of Bangladesh. This result stems directly from genocide, and the situation constitutes one of the most atrocious human rights crises of our time. The Rohingya are seen domestically as aggressors and internationally as victims. According to the World Bank, the Rakhine state, in which the Rohingya reside, is the least developed in Myanmar and holds a poverty rate of 78%. The Rohingya compromise 4% of the total population. No one person classified as Rohingya has access to citizenship or basic human rights, such as the right to vote, marry, or own property. The Rohingya's resulting susceptibility to persecution has led to tireless efforts to face the odds and form resistance movements. These efforts to effect change began as early as the 1950s, but have procured nothing more than increased abuses and desperation. Resultingly, tensions have only risen between the Rohingya and the rest of Myanmar as the rate of poverty, discrimination, and lack of access to resources parallels rising tensions. In 2013, a militant group known as the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, or ARSA, formed in response to the treatment of the Rohingya by the state, its military, and its majority Buddhist population. Its aggregate number of members is less than 600. ARSA is comprised of seasoned leaders from Bangladesh and Pakistan who have been trained by jihadist veterans of the wars in Afghanistan. Myanmar's response was to brand ARSA as a dangerous terrorist organization. ARSA coordinated attacks on dozens of small security facilities within the Rakhine state on the morning of August 25, 2017. They killed 12 military members and escaped with some weapons. ARSA released a broadcast stating that the attack was conducted to attract the attention of the international community, persuade young men to join the movement, and raise money from places such as Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. The military, in addition to attacking the militant group, began to burn the Rakhine state, and according to the Human Rights Watch, launched a campaign of rape against women and young children. This response was blatantly disproportionate to the initial attack. In addition, the military opened fire on fleeing civilians, tortured them, burned homes and villages, and planted landmines on the border crossings between Bangladesh and Myanmar. According to the international medical charity, Doctors Without Borders, 6,700 Rohingya were killed within just the first month of attacks in September 2017. By December, more than 688,000 were forced to flee and 392 villages had been destroyed. Approximately 10,000 additional were killed, 70% due to gunshot wounds and 9% burned to death. The United Nations, or UN, France, and eight Nobel Peace Prize holders immediately labeled it as an act of genocide. In subsequent years, there are few who do not characterize the systematic destruction of the Rohingya as genocide. The primary reason for these rising crimes against humanity is that of poor civil military relations in the country. Myanmar is a Swedo democracy that appears to be led by the government, but is, in reality, tethered to the military's agenda. I will discuss this further in the analyzation portion of my presentation, but first it is important to discuss the historical and cultural background of Myanmar. Myanmar, formerly known as Burma, has a political history that is primarily dominated by a strong military presence known as the Tat Madao. The state's history consists of repetitive human rights violations, political corruption, and poor economic management systems. Myanmar's government policies towards its Muslim Rohingya population since the 1970s have caused millions to flee, seeking refuge in countries such as Bangladesh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand. In 2017, the Tat Madao began an ethnic cleansing campaign against the Rohingya, referred by the military as aliens from Bengal, with claims that they are aiming to stabilize the country's western region, the Rakhine State. Reports rapidly rose of unethical and significant violence, including horrific acts such as arson, murder, and rape. Before the genocide, the Rakhine State was home to approximately one million Rohingya. They do not speak the same language as Myanmar's Buddhist majority, nor do they share the same cultural values. 
In fact, there is widespread hatred from extremist Buddhist monks who have allied themselves politically with the Tat Madao expressly to clash with the Rohingya minority. The Rohingya practice a variation of Sunni Islam. They are denied recognition as one of Myanmar's official 135 ethnic groups and are instead considered illegal immigrants from Bangladesh, even with their centuries of history in the Rakhine state. The Rohingya first appeared in the region when Rakhine was under the rule of the 15th century Muslim Aragon Kingdom. Their name stems from this kingdom and was coined in the 1950s, with Rohang meaning Aragon and Gya meaning from. The number of Rohingya Muslims rose when this power transitioned to British India and kept rising through Burma's independence, name change, and succeeding military-led regimes. Legally, the Rohingya have no status and thus no right to citizenship in Myanmar. They are granted no legal documentation such as passports or birth, marriage, and death certificates. This renders the entire population as stateless. The law banning the Rohingya population the right to citizenship by birth was written into law in 1962 by Myanmar's military leaders. Instead of citizen rights, they were offered white cards, which granted them limited rights as temporary residents from the 1990s to 2015. They were revoked when the government decided that Muslim minorities should not receive the right to vote. One particularly appalling fact is that there are other Myanmar Muslims that have access to citizenship and fundamental human rights. These Muslims hold Burmese names, speak Burmese, and tie their roots to that of Burma. On the other hand, the Rohingya Muslims face discrimination in Myanmar. They have been denied basic human rights such as citizenship because they hold Muslim names, speak a Bengali dialect, and tie their roots to the Aragon Kingdom. Because not all Muslims in the country, but rather just of the Rohingya ethnicity, are persecuted, it is plausible that this is more of an issue of nationalism and race instead of a religious conflict between Muslims and Buddhists. In the burned ruins of towns, the Myanmar government has built security thresholds including weapon centers, homes, and infrastructure. Supposedly, these are the villages to which refugees may be allowed to return in the future. Due to international pressure, Myanmar signed an agreement with Bangladesh for refugees to return to these renovated villages. However, in order for this agreement to carry through, the government has to recognize that these same refugees resided in Myanmar. This is difficult because there is no way for the Rohingya to prove their residency. Moreover, Few want to return to the area because of the ongoing persecution they have faced for over half a century. Evidence gathered by human rights activists illustrates that the attack by ARSA was merely a convenient excuse for the Tat Madao to launch their genocidal campaign. Weeks before the small strike occurred, the Tat Madao began fast-tracking recruitment and called in two army battalions to move on the Rakhine state. Audio recordings found by human rights group Amnesty International contained threats to Rohingya Muslims to leave the state peacefully unless they wanted the military to burn down villages and destroy everything in its path. So, what led the UN's top human rights officials to call Myanmar a textbook case of ethnic cleansing? The most plausible answer is that the civilian government holds no control over the military, and even if the civilian government were to attempt to end the military campaign against the Rohingya, they would be unable to do so. Inside Myanmar's government lies both civilian and military components. From the outside, it seems as though the two are equally balanced. However, this is far from true. The civilian government holds a power-sharing agreement with Myanmar's military. In other words, the elected officials are more or less figureheads, while the military officials formulate and execute critical arrangements. In 1962, the Tat staged a coup that has led them to be the most powerful political actor until 2011 directly. Since 2011, the Tat has led the state indirectly. This long rule has allowed the military to intertwine itself in all aspects of politics, society, religion, culture, economics, and law. It has also isolated Myanmar from the rest of the world, and this alienation had resulted in such a devastating economic decline in 2003 that the Tat Madao was forced to reevaluate its strategy. To adjust, the Tat Madao developed a plan known as the Seven Step Roadmap to Discipline Flourishing Democracy. The plan was to establish a legislative body known as the National Convention, introduce a supposedly genuine and disciplined democratic system to the public, draft a new constitution, hold a national referendum to endorse said constitution, 
hold elections to form additional legislative bodies, convene these representatives into the bicameral assembly of the union, and allow these newly elected government leaders and authoritative bodies to together continue the task of democratization. The referendum, held in May 2008, took place days after the largest natural disaster in Burmese history, the Cyclone Nargis. The regime claims 92.48% of legal citizens approved the new constitutions and laws. The free and fair elections that followed were denounced and labeled fraudulent by the UN and the West as a whole. The key factor of this seven-step plan was the formation of the 2008 constitution, which was designed by the military. The Tatmadaw was removed from civilian control, both objectively and subjectively, thanks to this constitution, which stipulates that the Tatmadaw has the right to independently administer and adjudicate all affairs of the armed forces, as well as enables the defense services to be able to participate in the national political leadership role of the state. This means that the military is still primarily dominant in governance and politics, even after the straight transition to a quote-unquote democracy. Myanmar's government is subsequently quasi-civilian in nature. The generals formed the constitution so that even if opposing parties won every single seat that they were allotted, that opposition would still be unable to alter the constitution because of the military's residual control. In addition, the vital governmental role of commander-in-chief automatically goes to an active duty general that is not answerable to civilian oversight. A key example of the blended civil-military relations in Myanmar is the way elections are held. There are three proposed candidates, one from each house, and the third appointed by the military. One candidate will serve as the elected president, and the other two will serve as vice presidents. Thus, at the very least, the Tatmadaw is guaranteed one vice presidential position. In addition to this, 25% of seats in each house of the Myanmar parliament are comprised of military officers who are appointed by the Tatmadaw. The constitution requires that 75% of votes in each house are required for amendments to be adopted, which gives the Tatmadaw significant power in the country's policy-making decisions in addition to ensuring that no political changes are made without military cooperation. Also, the country's security network is controlled primarily by the military. The Constitution commits six of the 11 members of the National Defense and Security Council, a key decision-making body, to be appointed by the military's commander-in-chief. In addition, the National Defense and Security Council selects three influential ministerial posts in its civil organizations on defense, border affairs, and home affairs. Even outside of parliament and government, the military holds significant power. The General Administration Department, or GAD, which controls the civil service for state and regional governments, is controlled by current or former military officers and serves as the epicenter responsible for registrations such as birth, marriage, death, and property ownership, the same certificates unavailable to the Rohingya. It is also answerable for the everyday functioning of government management as well as state and regional management. Naturally, the military still has significant power over Myanmar's economy. The Tatmadaw sets its own budget and spends without any civilian control. Active and retired officers hold over 80% of the economy, the military budget is currently $2.14 billion and accounts for 13.9% of government spending and 3% of the national GDP. This amount is larger than both health care and education in the country, which is dwindling rapidly due to the country's resources being used elsewhere. The Tatmadaw is an impressive force of military organization that contains a hierarchical structure that stems directly from the commander-in-chief. However, the Tatmadaw has little access to professionalizing its military due to Western governments such as the United Kingdom and the United States repeatedly denying assistem, assistance as well as refusing to lift sanctions unless the Tatmadaw withdraws from politics and resolves conflicts with ethnic minority groups within the country. As a result, Myanmar has been completely reliant on China, who willingly overlooks the massive human rights offenses within the country. China serves as Myanmar's largest training partner and even sponsors the military's junta, or political power group that commands a country after seizing power. Currently, the Chinese plan on building a deep seaport within the Rakhine state to give Chinese ships access to the Indian Ocean. Because of this, Chinese President Xi Jinping 
describes Chinese Myanmar relations as at their, quote, best ever. Recently, however, the internal stability, economic development, trade, and rule of law have all faltered in Myanmar to such an extent that China has encouraged the end of the violence and instead wants to be viewed as a peacemaker in the region. In other words, China will react based on its strategic and economic interest only. The consequence of this is an unprofessional army lacking basic morale and training who would rather extend ethnic conflict within Myanmar's border to justify its enduring role than install peace. According to the Washington Post, generals stand by their actions on their campaign against the Rohingya and deem all these actions necessary. The military has allowed such power to pursue these human rights violations because of the poor civil military relations in the country. In 1946, social democratic politician Aung San seized control of the government and began overturning the military's power after successfully gaining independence from Britain. However, his term was short-lived, and he was assassinated later that year in his council chamber. His daughter, Aung San Suu Kyi, has tried to reintroduce her father's democratic ideals and principles decades later. Today, she is a well-known human rights icon after she was forced into house arrest by the military for 15 years over her victory in democratic elections. In 2010, she was released to showcase the emergence of a peaceful, innocuous military presence in Myanmar. Today, Suu Kyi claims that her relationship with the military is, quote, not that bad and that the three generals in her cabinet are, quote, rather sweet after the military would not remove a clause in the constitution that barred her from being elected president due to her husband holding a foreign passport she alongside the mostly ceremonial president hitin kya created a prime minister-like role and granted her this title of state counselor with the recent appointment of Suu Kyi as Myanmar's current leader and de facto head of state, as well as Nobel Peace Prize winner, the international community assumed that order would appear in the country and abuses would subsequently dissolve once the figurehead known for advocating human rights came into play. Furthermore, Suu Kyi is not influential enough to outlast the firm hold the state's powerful generals have on politics. In addition, the majority of Myanmar's population supports the military's campaign against the Rohingya, resulting in a two-thirds dynamic in which there is more support for continued human rights abuses than against. She is then forced to balance what power she does have. Notwithstanding, instead of pursuing more democratic means, she has adopted further autocratic styles and does not attempt to aid the areas in which she does have significant influence. For instance, she controls the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, retains the presidency, serves as the party chief for the Central Executive Committee, and sits on 16 other governmental committees. Suu Kyi has also denied the vital aid extended to her by powerful Western allies to assist in ending the conflict. She turns a blind eye towards the violations in the Rakhine state and refuses to admit that ethnic cleansing is taking place. Instead, Suu Kyi blames critics for the rift between Buddhists and Muslims in her country. She would not allow United Nations human rights investigators into the country, which led to a UN fact-finding panel that released recommendations to send military officers to the International Criminal Court, or ICC, and to install arms embargoes and sanctions. Journalists who have been brave enough to attempt to document the crisis have been sent to prison, and international human rights organizations have criticized Suu Kyi for prohibiting press and social media in the Rakhine state. However, she did allow the former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan to study the Rohingya issue and later helped build a Myanmar government assembled 10 member advisory board. Notably, one appointed ambassador to the UN stepped away from this board and labeled it as a whitewash and a cheerleading squad for the government, so its intentions are questionable. Lastly, some have labeled Suu Kyi as racist after she muttered, quote, no one told me I was going to be interviewed by a Muslim during a BBC interview. She also uses the slang term Bengali, meaning illegal Rohingya immigrants from Bangladesh, and has exhibited worries of, quote, global Muslim power. While Suu Kyi should not receive all of the blame of the atrocities occurring in Myanmar, one can place some blame on her for being complacent and not pressing the issue where she is capable. Just as the government power shares with the military, it also shares blame in the Rohingya affairs.
A healthy balance of civil-military relations simply does not exist in Myanmar. Su Kyi's government holds no civilian control, objectively or subjectively, over the Tat Medau, nor does she want to move against the military. Her strategy of inaction and political cover allow the plight of the Rohingya to continue. In addition, the majority of the population, 68% ethnic Bamar and 87.9% Buddhist, favor the removal and ethnic cleansing of the minority Rohingya Muslim population. In other words, no one with significant power inside the country is likely to protest against the ongoing ethnic cleansing campaign. Even if protests were to begin, the restrictive environment discourages freedom of speech, which in turn hinders necessary critiques, disputes, and disagreements that compromise components of a healthy democracy. The phenomenon that is occurring in Myanmar is the result of a clash of nationalism instead of religious or ethnic conflict. Both Buddhist and Muslim nationalists seek to protect and preserve their national ethnicities and religious identities. These two nations of people, the Bamar and the Rohingya, both have reasonable claims to statehood. However, the Bamar refuse to recognize the Rohingya's claim and neglect to even grant them citizenship in the state of which they, and many of their past ancestors, were born. Other factors include the inaction by Su Kyi as well as her political covering of the military's repugnant behavior, the Tat Medau's power over both the government and political spheres, the public pressure against the Rohingya by nationalists, and the lack of international aid. Another important variable to consider is that the democratic space in Myanmar is fragile. The Suedo civilian government is under control by the military, but in a typical democracy, the government should ideally exert control over the military. India, China, and a multitude of other Southeastern Asian authoritarian countries are not concerned with Rohingya unless their economic interests become intertwined. These states also face issues with Muslim minorities and turn a blind eye to the massive human rights abuses within their region. Western democracy has attempted to aid by speaking out against the campaign and pressing embargoes and sanctions on Myanmar, but these efforts have only pushed Myanmar towards China and the assistance it promises. Because Myanmar is not a major player in the world economy, policy shifts would be virtually useless. Again, Myanmar would only turn to China for economic welfare if Western countries press further sanctions. Lastly, the UN report and the significant amount of world leaders' recommendations to, the, to take Myanmar to the ICC are also null and void because Myanmar is not a signatory to the 1998 Rome Statute that established the court. This is important because generals charged with crimes against humanity and genocide cannot properly be brought to justice. The only case in which Myanmar could face due process in front of the ICC is if all five permanent Security Council members were to agree. However, China and Russia are more than likely to object, even with continued pressure from the UK, the US, and France. Just because the odds are not in the Rohingya's favor does not mean that nothing can be done about the continuing crimes against humanity. Support of non-governmental organizations that promote tolerance, education programs, pressure on the Tat Medau, and human rights activist groups such as the Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, the Arakan Project, and Fortify Rights can all help bring necessary and vital aid to the refugees. However, this funding can be rendered useless if the problem is not fixed at its core. All in all, under Myanmar's civilian military government, the policies against the Rohingya are the following. Denial of citizenship, denial of suffrage and representation, denial of education and employment, restrictions on movement and restrictions on marriage, religious conversion, and procreation. Efforts to change policy are crucial to peace in the state. The center of the struggle lies within the nationalist clash of Burmese, Buddhist, and Rohingya Muslims. If policymakers continue to brand the conflict as a religious threat, coexistence between Muslims and Buddhists may completely shatter. The crisis must be looked at through the lens of statehood. Civil relations, separate from the military, need to be built between the two nations of people in order to promote peace and understanding. Civil military relations, in this case, are crucial. Because of the way the Constitution was formed, relations cannot improve between civilians if the military does not either remove its involvement or end its campaign against the Rohingya. The military generals responsible for the extensive crimes must also answer to justice in front of an international tribunal to promote not only stability in the state, but a healthy sense of democracy. 
If attitudes do not shift significantly to provide an adequate, lasting resolution to the conflict, as well as a full legal accounting for the crimes, the prospect of peace is impossible. If you would like to conduct further research on this issue, I have attached my citations below for scholarly works and news articles. The citations for graphs and pictures are placed on the slideshow. Thank you for your attention.